Hey everyone, this is day four, week three, as we continue to do our uh, breakfast from life. So we've done our, what do we do? We, well, our, our banana peel, our stinky banana peel. Then we did our Danish that didn't work out, the video didn't work out, the painting did. And then we did a bunch of uh, blueberries on a bowl. Um, I was trying to do like a really, really nice um, ellipses, uh, which is always like my bane. That's my kryptonite. I hate doing ellipses. They are very, very, very tough to do. I know there's people that have tips on how to do them properly. This is my one tip. They're tough, period. Um, then yesterday, we did uh, a little strangled bag of tea on, on top of uh, my spoon with a ton, ton of yellow. And we were trying to make that work, which is pretty hard to make that color work. But it made like an eerie, I thought it was just a very, very cool painting to paint because it was gonna be weird with that color and the fact that uh, I decided to put it way up in the image plane uh, and then all this yellow in the bottom that was sort of degrading, uh, I thought was really nice. It just made like a weird painting, a weird, you know, it's a, it, the subject matter is not weird, but it's presented in a, in a kind of strange way, lit in a strange way because the, the, the shadow of the spoon actually prolongs the, like the shape of the spoon. So I, I, I thought it was, it was pretty cool. But we did that, which was a little weird. I have been playing a little bit with complementaries, and today I thought, okay, let's try to, to do this like, you know, a very, very simple uh, complementary painting. And I thought of green and red, and green, one of the best, you know, fruits to paint, a uh, pear. Uh, it, it's just, a pear is just a perfect, perfect uh, fruit to paint because it is, you know, it does have a, sort of regular shape, but it does have irregularities in its surface. So even though it can be simple to block in, you can then travel through the surface and see like little indentations and the way kind of light travels. So it has like peaks and valleys and it makes it super, super nice because it feels very, very organic. And again, citing Uglo, because he's like the one of the best painters ever. Um, you know, we're trying to find facets and we're trying to find, you know, plain breaks in, in what is essentially a very kind of soft, uh, round fruit. And that exercise is just wonderful. One tip that I can give you is that, you know, if, if let's say there's a uniform local color to a fruit and you're not distracted by changes in, in hue in the local color, let's say it's, it's fairly uh, uniform, the color. Whenever you see a change in, in value or a change in hue, it means there's a plain break. It, it means that the, the form is actually shifting and turning in space. So whenever you see that, try to push that because that's actually telling you, uh, you know, speaking about the three dimensionality of the object. So that's what we're going to do today. Super simple, but really, really effective. Red background, green pair, simple, nice. So. Let's try to do that and let's try to do a nice painting, you know, out of that. So that's it. Bye. Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, I realized that I had mentioned that we were going to concentrate on the contrast of uh, using complementary colors for today, be it that the, you know, the pear is green and that I'm choosing a red background to put it uh, against it. But, and I think I mentioned it briefly in the, uh, in the last video, the contrast of complementaries is actually not, you know, the probably not even the most popular way of achieving contrast in an image uh, for centuries. And especially, and this is, you know, very close uh, to me because I, I am an illustration major. I actually absolutely love illustration. I graduated as an illustrator. I worked, I mean, I don't know if I was um, very effective at it, but I, I worked on it as an illustrator for years also. Um, but I still, it's it, illustration is very, very dear and close to my heart as, you know, comic books and, you know, stuff that they do for um, animations, like concept work that they do for animations or video games. That's That sort of work is actually something that I, I really, really do appreciate. So... As an illustrator at heart that I am, I'm always reminded of the tools that we have at our disposal when we want to achieve contrast. And the reason that we want to achieve contrast is because 
um, in a painting, in an image, the place where the highest contrast lies on is actually where your eye is going to go immediately. So if you have your lightest light right next to your darkest dark, your eye, and that's just how human you know, eyes work, your eye is just going to immediately, immediately travel to that moment of, of the image. And even though there's tons of illustrators that did this you know, to amazing degrees, I think that the one, you know, when I, when I kind of close my eyes and think back, I think that the one that did it, you know, the best, I feel, it was Dean Cornwell, actually. You could probably look at every single Dean Cornwell painting, and there are moments in the painting where he is highly, highly conscious of value. And this is probably especially true because the way that images were reproduced, you know, back in the early 20th century, um, and the fact that many times they didn't have, you know, full color and they could only use maybe one color and then black and white. But they had to communicate through value. So if you look at any Dean Cornwall painting, and, and you know, he was, he was amazing at finding uh, elements in the picture that would you know, give him the excuse to make the, you know, his brightest bright right next to a darkest dark. One of the things he would, he would do is almost like a line decker arrow collar shirt against the, uh, the dark suit. But he would always have like a, like a white shirt or a white dress right next to like white atmosphere or like a piano or just like shadow. But it, it, he would command your vision and he would tell you exactly where to go. And that's, that's something super, super powerful you know, about contrast. But again, you know, contrast doesn't have to rely upon value exclusively. When we start thinking about color, and this is very true for this this painting that uh, I'm blocking in uh, just now, um, we also can use all the properties of color to achieve contrast. So if you think about the properties of color, you start thinking about saturation, let's say, and you can actually think, okay, I'm going to push saturation. What that actually means is that you can actually start from a very neutral or grayed down color um, and actually introduce, uh, you know, all of a sudden out of nowhere, uh, you know, I don't know how that would work, but uh, you could introduce a very, very saturated color and your eye is going to immediately go to that saturated color. So if there's uh, saturation among grayness, our eye is going to love that moment and it's going to go, you know, directly to that moment. Uh, another example that has to do with properties of, of color to achieve contrast is temperature. So if, let's say, you introduce a moment of warmness within an atmosphere of coolness, then, you know, your eye is just going to immediately understand that there's a a big, big difference between those two temperatures, and it's just going to go to that moment where they clash, uh, where there's tension. It's just going to gravitate towards that. It's going to travel the whole image, but it's going to land uh, at that spot. And the one that we're going to concentrate on today for this very, very simple painting is uh, contrast by complementaries. Now, our notion of complementaries is actually something that that has changed throughout the years. And it has changed because the color wheel as we know it nowadays is, is a fairly, I mean fairly, but is a fairly kind of new idea. Uh, not, not always were the uh, um, primary colors regarded as yellow, red, and blue. Today, for us, that's a given. But, um, you know, 200 years ago, uh, it, it wasn't the case. And they were trying to figure out what that, you know, color wheel actually looked like and which colors were actually good when paired with each other. And that actually has changed a bit. The notion that there were certain colors that would have effect on other colors more, than, more so than the rest of the um, colors in the uh, color wheel, in the color spectrum, it's not new. It doesn't come with our acknowledgement of the light spectrum. Um, it actually comes, you know, it, although not scientifically, but intuitively. They couldn't really explain it scientifically, but it came intuitively from even from like Greece. Um, but in Renaissance, early Renaissance, they were actually speaking about 
um, the relationships of colors, the affectation a color would have when put against another color, or saying how um, a particular color would look better. You know, they, they wouldn't really understand why, but it, they, they would say it would look better if it was right next to another color. That better is actually just accepting that that's how our vision works. That's, that's what our eye finds and our brain finds attractive. That's what we go for. So if we see, if we see in a bunch of foliage a red rose, that's where we're going to go. It's red among green, and that's exactly where we're going to go. We can't really explain it. We, you know, it's, it's almost like instinctual. That's the way we're wired. But we finally landed on you know, the more contemporary version of the, uh, of the color wheel, where there's primary colors, yellow, red, blue, and there's secondaries, um, orange, green, and purple. And you know, the color that is opposite to... Um, to the uh, to one color in the uh, color wheel is it's complementary, so orange and blue and red and green for example, and what that means for us and I, I and I always thought about this because I, I when I, I remember when as when I was a student I would think well does that mean that every single orange and every single blue are just perfect complementaries or what does perfect complementaries mean, and theoretically and this is theoretically because it doesn't quite happen but. You know, it doesn't quite happen with pigments. But theoretically, it means that if you put, if you mix the two together, you would get a perfect neutral. That is almost impossible. I'm going to say it's a very, very rare case that you get a perfect neutral when you mix um, complementaries. You, you're always going to get like a, a, a gray that has a hue to it and it has you know, depending on which colors you start from, it has some saturation to it too. So there, there are traces of those colors. So if you're mixing um, uh, orange and blue, you're going to get a gray that has an orange tint to it, or you're going to get um, uh, a gray that has a blue tint to it, depending on which color was dominant in your mix. Uh, but you're never going to quite get like a perfect, perfect complementary. I remember thinking that... Uh, Cat orange, for example, was like a very, very good complementary to a cobalt blue light or like a cerulean blue. You know, there's tons of people that love those two colors mixing together because it it makes a very, very vibrant um, gray when you when you mix the two. And in terms of reds, I remember just loving the uh, relation because they're they're quite similar in nature too. That a lizard crimson and viridian would have. They are almost perfect. They are both very, very cool, transparent, dark, you know, they're almost like the, they're the same value, essentially. You don't get a perfect neutral because you do get almost like a purple gray. Those two colors just are almost perfect for each other. And it's very strange to think about them that way, but it that's the case. And I remember um, with uh, my teacher, Max, that I had mentioned before, one mix that he would many, many times use was um, uh, cad red and cinnabar green. Cinnabar green is like, um, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's, it's not a, such a saturated green. It's more like, um, it's, it's like a grayer, a less saturated yellow green, I would say, uh, the cinnabar green light. It's like a yellow green, cinnabar green dark. It's a, it's a, a tiny bit bluer, earthier maybe. Uh, but I, I remember that when you mix that with uh, cad red, it just knocked down the saturation of that cad red almost immediately. And it was like perfect, perfect complementary. You know, in my mind, I was like, okay, that's what complementaries do. I don't need to find like exactly what, you know, what, what the precise green is that works perfectly for cad red. A lot of people go like, well, you need cad, you know, you need cad green or you need a uh, permanent green or I don't know. Um, but essentially what you want is for them to cancel each other out. So if, you're at, if you actually have a string of paint and you're saying like, whoa, that's a little too red, you can actually mix a little bit of green and then, you know, knock it back a little bit. That's what complementaries do, which is, which is absolutely fascinating. But, you know, that's when you're mixing. But when you actually put those two colors right next to each other in the uh, picture plane, what happens is that the greenness of that hue, it, let's think about it very, very abstractly, uh, because colors tend to be, we associate them with just very simple things nowadays, but, but honestly, they're very, very abstract terms. But 
if you think about it, the green right next to the red is actually accentuating. Like, let's say uh, the green is working for the red. So the green right next to the red is actually accentuating the redness of the red, which is very weird. I know it sounds like we're trying to put into words almost this thing that is how our brains are wired, how, you know, this instinct that we've had probably for, you know, millennia. And, and it's so hard to just say the redness of a red, like, how do you explain that? The quality of something being red. But, you know, we don't know what it is to be red. Red is just something like a wavelength, you know, a moment <laughs> a moment in that visible wavelength that we understand as red, that we've nominated as red. But so when we say the redness of something, it's a, it's a very, very strange, strange thing. But, you know, essentially what complementaries do, they accentuate, they emphasize the quality of the other color the inherent quality of the other color. So the green right next to the red would emphasize the redness of the red. The red right next to the green would emphasize the greenness of the green. You know, I know, I know this is, it, it sounds a little bit ridiculous. It sounds like, oh my God, this is, this is just words. It's just dumb semantics, but it, it's not. It actually, it's, it's <laughs> the closest way I can think of explaining how color actually works. So by by surrounding, in this case, this pair, this, you know, that is not, it's, it's not 100% green. It's not, it's not what I was referring to, like, the local color of that pair is not, you know, perfect green. It's not just like you dipped it in green paint and it's like a homogenous green covering the pair. This pair actually feels greener in some areas, yellower in others, and a little bit warmer in, in, in others. Now, mind you, that is this pair in sort of, understanding this pair again abstractly in kind of a vacuum but I decided to surround it with red you know I put like a red little backdrop like a little piece of paper and I, I put light on that pair and you know a lot of the light is going to bounce from that red and is going to fill up a lot of the shadow not just it's it's not going to feel the sh fill the shadow of the pair it's actually going to fill also the places where it's turning in space. So the bottom plane of the pair is actually going to be affected by that red. And because that red is on a horizontal plane and not like a vertical plane, the, the one of the base, that's actually, you know, not getting a lot of the light. That's why the background is actually a little bit lighter and cooler because of my cool light. But then the part of the plane that's horizontal since it's not getting a lot of that light directly, it's actually speaking about the local color of that paper, so it feels a lot more saturated. So a lot of that red is actually filling in that bottom plane of the pair that actually has to turn. If we weren't going to acknowledge that, then our pair would feel kind of unaffected by the space that it's surrounding. And I think that one of the most important things when describing a volume in space has to be um, understanding the the affectation that the space has on the object and the object can be a human being or it can be a pair but we have to acknowledge and we have to be mindful that every single uh, thing that is happening around us if you know we can be pair or we can be humans but every single thing that is happening around us every single thing that surrounds us every single thing that's bouncing off light um, is affecting us is actually putting us in that specific time and space. So I think that that acknowledgement and, and, and for us to always, always think about how every single element in, you know, almost like the universe is linked is actually helping us understand the painting because we, we are not making decisions that live by themselves. None, nothing in a painting lives by itself. Everything in a painting has to be related to something else in the painting. It has to play off of something else. It has to. It absolutely has to. So there are moments, for example, in this pair that are greener, that it's almost like this pair is struggling to say, hey, green is my local color. Like, I'm actually a green pair. But then other areas are where the, the pair almost, like, lets go and says, okay, I am a green pair, but all of this light, you know, this cool light that is shining upon me, is affecting my local color too, is actually bleaching it a little bit. It's, it's making it maybe a little bit cooler since it's a, a very cool bluish light. It's going to give me a, 
you know, there's going to be a tint to me and it's going to change my color. So maybe some areas are going to appear a little more yellower than others, a little bit cooler than others. And all this red paper that's surrounding me, and I like how I'm speaking like I'm the pair right now for some reason, um, <laughs> all this red color that's surrounding me is actually affecting my, my color, the perception of my local color. The pair is never going to change, never. The pair is going to be a green pair, always. But our perception of that pair under a specific you know, lighting condition and with a specific backdrop, in, in this case a very, very red, very saturated backdrop, is going to make, you know, our almost like our definition of that pair start to change. And, and it's beautiful when we start to say, whoa, that, you know, before I put that pair in, you know, on top of that red paper under that light, it was a green, it was like a, a green thing, you know, I, it was Hulk. <laughs> But then I take it here and now suddenly I see oranges and yellow greens and, you know, green blues and, you know, a ton of reflected red all over the place. And that's what's beautiful. That's what's absolutely beautiful. It just makes you realize that uh, to paint a green pair, you don't need greens. You need your whole palette. You need, <laughs> you need to make, you know, all the assumptions that you have of that green pair, just throw them at the window and just say, okay, yes, this is something that I understand as green, but I'm going to see how that green is actually going to start to be affected by every single condition that's uh, surrounding it. So uh, as an invitation to, to explore uh, artists' work that I, that I feel are making, you know, are, that are sort of contemporary colorists, but in a way that I actually have a little more connection to because... Uh, the more sort of abstract color theory that was prevalent in the 20th century, like let's say Barnett Newman, it is a product of its time and I totally get it. But to me, I like color theory that's applied to nature and that starts from nature or that, you know, at least has a kind of like an anchor point in nature. And I feel there's a couple of people that I would totally recommend that are doing really super exciting things in terms of color. Um, all of them very, very different, but I think like if you if you see the three of them, they're I think they're all amazing, and you could totally learn uh, a ton about the the relationships of the colors that they're using in the picture and how and what the effect is, that, which is actually the coolest thing. So, uh, first person would be Stephen Shearer, which is a Canadian painter. He does a ton of self portraits, but it's very kind of quirky, eerie, like Otto Dixie kind of strange. Um, uh, weird size relationships. I don't know. It's a, it's a very, very strange artist. I absolutely love, and he's a draftsman and a painter, and I love how there's kind of no difference between those two techniques, and I, I, I think he's, he's absolutely fantastic, so check his work out. Um, the other painter would be Sangram Majumdar, and I, I feel he's been just kicking ass for the last, like, I don't know, you know, 15 years just doing incredible painting. Um, and he explores tons, tons, tons of different hues. I mean, colors that I would have never, that, you know, I'm a very, very limited, uh, painter in terms of my color choices. That is my choice that, that has been my decision for, you know, for the last 20 years to be, to have very <laughs> little friends in my palette, but know them very, very well. I, I absolutely love that. But I think someone like um, Sangram, Sangram paints colors that I don't know how to mix, <laughs> that I have never, ever, ever had in my palette, that I just don't, I wouldn't even know what to buy if I wanted to, <laughs> if I wanted to paint with some of those colors. And he makes them works and he pushes the saturation of them. And I love especially when he, when he just has an accent of a color that is, you know, super saturated or it's just a highly specific color and it's surrounded by all these other colors that are meant to offset it or to be like to nestle it, you know, in a perfect way. I, I think he's fascinating. And lastly, I would uh, suggest um, Emil Robinson. I think he has a foundation as a very, very traditional artist. He's a fantastic draftsman in terms of, of, a, of like, let's say naturalistic uh, depictions. Um, but he, he understands color also at a very, very abstract um, level. And he's, I think he's done so much over the last probably 10 years, so, so many like different types of works. 
and and he just navigates from from figurative work towards abstraction then back to figurative and uh, it's you know it's it's uh, it's really wonderful but his constant his was one constant is is that he's always 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 just mindful of highly specific color relationships in a particular painting so he's very very sensitive of a painting uh setting its own um rules in terms of what is happening you know regarding the color relationships that are being used in that painting so every single painting is like a new book you know that could be written about color so check check those three people out i mean i'm there's so many more people i mean as i'm saying this i'm thinking of like uh pixel chan like you know peter chan that does just insane insane saturation work uh that there's just tons of people that are doing uh fascinating stuff uh, that has to do with with how we understand the color when we put other colors around it and it sounds like a very simple thing when when we when i describe it that way but uh it's actually a lifetime of learning and of exploring so the opportunity to do that today came from just looking at a green pair against a red background but again the the reflection that can be spurred from from this moment can actually be you know uh, work that can take 40 years you know in the future or you know that can be our lifetime so so again uh, the, the the purpose of what we're doing here is just you know to open those doors so we want to be working every day so that we uh, when the time comes that we need to be sensitive to something we are ready we are absolutely ready because we've trained ourselves and we've we've become sensitive to to nature that's that's why we do this you know to to train you know this is our daily exercise so i hope you guys can uh <laughs> exercise with me uh tomorrow so i'll see you guys tomorrow bye